family and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord. We want to share with you today a teenage saint. He's such a powerful, powerful role model for the youth of today, St. Rose of Viterbo. This is the story of a saint and a sinner. This story, another part of our 2,000 year journey as a church and a people of God, is about Rose, who was raised to sainthood, and Frederick, the sinner, who God would use to raise her to that height of piety and virtue which forms a saint. What brought us to Rose of Viterbo initially? She was a saint whose body the Lord left incorrupt on earth as one of the signs of her sanctity. A body which was not decomposed and is miraculously preserved is one, only one, of the signs which the Lord gives us to recognize someone's holiness. It is not what makes one a saint. This particular sign is strictly a gift to the saint verifying the Lord's miraculous intervention and a gift to us of God's power and love. What will he not do to bring us closer to him through faith? Consequently, he leaves us signs or gifts to help us in our journey toward him and heaven. In the case of Padre Pio, for example, although he had all the gifts, by location, stigmata for 40 years, perfect confessor, reading men's hearts, this is not what the Holy See has used to determine his holiness and the cause for beatification and ultimate canonization. Padre Pio has been judged as with all candidates for the virtuous life he led in his vocation, in his case, the priesthood. Once again, the world is in turmoil and the church is under attack without compromise. Our Lord Jesus would not compromise and they crucified him. His loyal vicars would not compromise and they, along with Mother Church, over our 2,000 year history, have been nailed to the cross. Knowing this, our popes, his vicars, chosen as they are by and through the intervention of the Holy Spirit, live and die for their spotless spouse the church. We cannot begin our story of a saint without first giving the historical background of why the Lord raised up this young girl. Whenever the world is threatened by a sinner, God raises up a saint and often a pope without compromise. Listen with your head and heart and ask yourself how this pertains to us, to our church, our country, and our world today. We are in the days of conquest and greed. Greed desiring more, requiring more, and then requiring more, conquering more. Out of necessity to feed this giant, conquests begot conquests. And so the freedom St. Paul spoke of, we no longer slaves, was once again set aside. The sacrifice of the many for the power of the few. To set the stage, let us begin with the sinners. Frederick I Barbarossa, a Roman emperor of the 12th century. His son, Emperor Henry VI, and grandson, Frederick II. As with all monsters, Hitler in the 20th century, and Frederick I, the red beard in the 12th, we, the foolish, believe we can coexist with them. So did the papacy in the 12th century with Frederick I. We will show you how the Holy See again and again attempts to coexist with one after the other. First Frederick I, then Frederick I's son, Henry VI, and his heir apparent, Frederick II, who would follow in his grandfather's footsteps. What began as cooperation between the papacy and Frederick would turn into Frederick I's greed overcoming his good judgment as he went about trying to reestablish the Carolingian rule of the 9th century and the Ottonian rule of the 10th century in Italy, which gave the emperors the royal right to take over the church and all the papal states, not only choosing prelates and making the bishopric a part of the empire, but requiring all bishops be friends of the emperor, taking all their orders from him. If you study the history of the church, you will see that the bear which seems to die in one century will revive in another century with the same desires, the same heresies, the same attacks, and the same ferocity. Is this not what happened when the German princes were able to use Martin Luther to do their dirty work? 
separating the church in Germany from the one true church, the Roman Catholic Church, for the supreme purpose of confiscating papal lands donated to the church over the centuries by grateful kings and queens. Jesus said, a house divided against itself will not stand. The northern states of Italy, tiny little fragmented states under separate rulers, separated from each other and the other little kingdoms of Italy, were fair game for any conqueror desiring to plunder and vanquish the divided weak. Frederick I decided the way he could make Italy once again an empire, a Hohenstaufen empire, was to begin with the conquering of the northern states of Italy. But he did not count on the Lombard League, who was in alliance with Alexander, the Pope at the time, and Frederick I was defeated in Legnano. Reconciliation came about between Pope Alexander and Frederick I, and consequently an alliance between Frederick I and the northern states. Whereas in the Peace of Constance, Frederick I granted the states some sort of de facto self-government, he maintained for himself and his heirs monumental rights as overlord. To the victor goes the spoils was no less true then than now. Although all his attempts at world domination were vanquished in his lifetime, Frederick I would be victorious in the end. What he could not do with force he did using his well-known infamous maneuvering. He married his son Henry VI to the heiress of the Kingdom of Sicily. In this way he realized his dream to establish a Hohenstaufen Empire in Italy. As the empire now encircled the Papal States, it not only weakened their position, but it made the northern states vulnerable. Gregory VIII became Pope. Frederick I, seeing the worldwide domination emanating from the onslaught of Saladin and his troops of Saracens, summoned his soldiers and prepared to head the Third Crusade to the Holy Land. Even that was to be thwarted as he drowned crossing the Salaf River in Asia Minor. Upon his father's death, Henry VI was crowned King of Germany in 1169, then 20 years later, King of Italy in 1189, and then King of Sicily in 1191. In addition, he was crowned Emperor that same year. Now, unlike his father, Henry was not very charismatic. He lacked his father's warmth, the charm that won so many over to his father. But what Henry lacked in personality, he surpassed his father in knowledge and love of the Catholic faith, that which he probably received from his strong Catholic mother, Queen Beatrix. During his brief rule, he had three aims. One, to gain the approval of the German princes as he came to the throne through hereditary succession, his father being from the Hohenstaufen family. Two, to arrange an agreeable territorial agreement with the papacy. And three, to lead a crusade to the Holy Land, completing what his father had started, the deliverance of Jerusalem and all the shrines of the Holy Land from the hands of the Saracens. The tragedy of the situation is, we hear the expression, like father, like son. And in, in this instance, like father, like grandfather, like son, grandson. Uh, Frederick I was a monster, and Frederick II, his grandson, was no better. The, this, the horrible thing about it was, was that Frederick II was charismatic. He, uh, he knew better. He had been brought up by his mother in the faith, and he had such great potential. He never had to raise a, 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 a musket, a, a gun, to any of the, the villages which he took over. They welcomed him gladly. But when, and as often happens with conquerors, when people are too readily willing to give their lives over to them, they take advantage. Frederick II was so charismatic, he was even able to convince the Pope that he was on his side. The Pope actually crowned him as the, uh, the Emperor. And then as time went on, he betrayed the Pope and he betrayed the people who had very willingly given him their lands and their loyalty. 
You know, this, it's the old story of how much is enough. He would not stop. The more land he took, the more land he wanted. And he started to infringe even on the papal lands, taking them away from the Pope and, and starving the people. The borders of his influence dangerously kept expanding. The Papal States, seeing the danger in the progressively unrestrained, inordinate power Frederick was amassing in the world, feared the church would be next. Sure enough, in 1231, Frederick made unbridled demands on the northern part of Italy, including the confiscation of land belonging to the papacy. The new pope, Gregory IX, condemned Frederick and charged him with heresy accusing him of desecrating, looting, and pillaging church property. Frederick's ambition to found an empire on the strength of his takeover of all Italy was forestalled by the Pope's action. A rose will bloom in the desert. Frederick II ex is excommunicated for the second time. He retaliates by attacking the Papal States, and this is where Rose of Viterbo comes in. In 1240, Frederick II decided to occupy Viterbo. The Lord, always with us in time of need, sends into this world of hopelessness and helplessness a baby. A few years before the frightening entry of Frederick II into the sweet, serene village of Viterbo, there was an entry that would inflame the populace with new courage and hope. A child was born. Little Rose would let out a cry that would grow and grow until it awakened the people to a new consciousness that they could make a difference. It was no accident the way Rose came into the world. The Lord brought, brought Rose into a family, although not of the nobility, and uh, they were rich in their spirituality. And so she grew up with an atmosphere of spirituality. By the time she was eight years old, she knew what she wanted to do with her life, and that was to become a cloistered nun. She had a vision of the Blessed Mother, in which Mother Mary told Rose she would be clothed in the habit of St. Francis. This was never to happen during her lifetime, but Our Lady's word to her would be fulfilled. Uh, our little Rose had a great love for the saints, she had a great love for uh, our Lord Jesus and the Eucharist, for our dear Mother Mary. She felt that she had a strong gift to give to the church. And when she was not allowed to become a nun because of not having a dowry, it hurt badly. But it was not enough for her to walk away from the church. She vowed all the more to work for our Lord Jesus and the church. And he who loves Jesus loves his people. And so when she saw the people suffering in the village, at age 12, she began to speak to them. She went on the corners, telling them about this Lord who loves them. This Lord telling them that they are children of God, that they are not slaves, that Jesus told them that they are no longer slaves, but they are brothers and sisters of his. They are his friends. They are part of the royal family of God himself, and that they should look upon themselves that way. They, the people started to feel like they were lower than the animals. And she said, look in the mirror of Jesus, because you are beautiful, you are royal. He got them to, she got them to go back out into the fields to work their farms, to work the animals. She got them praying the Angelus. They were praying the rosary. They were doing all the things that they needed to do to build their faith in our Lord Jesus and their own self-esteem. And little by little, in a period of a few years, they had built themselves up to the point where they felt like they were a viable force. And so new life came into the ancient village of Viterbo. Crowds began to gather. Her father became nervous. Soon the authorities would hear of her, and they would all be punished. What was wrong with her? After all, they had food on their table. He scolded, he pleaded, he berated her, he cajoled her. Finally, she leaving him no recourse, he threatened to beat her if she did not stay home and cease her preaching. Rose replied, if Jesus could be beaten for me, I can be beaten for him. I do what he has told me to do, and I must not disobey him. 
Father and daughter seemed at loggerheads when the local parish priest intervened. He urged, he urged the father to cease restraining Rose from doing her divinely appointed duty. He withdrew his objections and Rose was free to preach. And preach she did, tirelessly rising early in the morning, retiring late at night, as if one driven, knowing the time was short. This sounds like the urgency Jesus had with three short years to reach the children of God. It sounds like the time of Jesus. It sounds like our times today, with few speaking out. The John the Baptist of our day crying out in the desert, repent and be saved. And she had a great devotion to the poor. She cared more about feeding the poor than she did even about herself. And there's the story of the miracle of the, of the, uh, of the bread, bread, which yeah. Benny's going to tell you about. <laughs> It's just wonderful, you know. She, her family were very poor. Like everyone else, they were suffering. They had been bled dry. And so, but when the other poor came to the house, even though they had very little, do you know what Rose would do? She never took away from her family, so don't get any ideas. She saved what little bread she was given, and she gave it to the poor. And what happened one day was, uh, she had given away all the bread. And so she had nothing left when she went into the house to, and, and her mother wanted to know where the bread was. She opened her, her apron and there were all these roses. The bread had turned into roses. And what is the symbol of the rose? It's love. What is the symbol of the bread? Isn't it love? Didn't Jesus say, life. I, in life, I am the bread, the bread of life. life. And he is also the bread of love. She was free to preach for two years, standing on the street corners of the town, the crowds gathering, clamoring for more, her voice crying out, theirs joining in. They were a people to be reckoned with. She was uniting them, rallying support for the Pope and the church. They took up the cry, defend the pontiff's cause. Then some villagers who had sold their souls to the emperor for land and position became alarmed and began clamoring for her execution as an enemy of the empire. The mayor of the town would hear nothing of it, protesting the girl was innocent. He had a few reasons for his defense of Rose. He was a fair and just man, but also a prudent and wise man. He feared for his life, for by this time Rose had become a little Joan of Arc. The townspeople had been resigned to the carnage of their existence. Rose brought them reason for hope and rejoicing. There was a light at the end of the dark tunnel they had been journeying through, and the mayor pitied anyone trying to put out that light. But what was the wisest course? Banish Rose and her parents from the village. And so he ordered them escorted out of town. The little family settled in Soriano. It was in Soriano that little Rose prophesied that Frederick II would die shortly, and he did that very month. So the papal state was reinstated in the terrible. That's the second time you've come around, kid. The papal state was reinstated in the terrible, and she was free to come back. Now, there was one person who had been loyal to Frederick II who wanted her to be killed. Burned at the stake. Yeah. Burned at the stake, and so, and it was a woman. And she said, I'm going to have you burned at the stake. And Rose said to her, she has to be quick about it, thanking her for the privilege of dying a martyr's death for the faith. The <laughs> woman was completely shocked by this, turned around. She not only changed her mind about wanting to have her burned at the stake, but she became loyal to the Pope herself. Well, it was time for Rose to have her dream. The mother, Blessed Mother had told her that she was going to wear the habit of St. Francis, and so she went to the convent. As her family was very poor by this time, she had no dowry, and so they wouldn't accept her. And these were her prophetic words. You will not have me now, but perhaps you will be more willing when I am dead. Seeing the piety and the little missionary who had brought so much light into everyone's life, the parish priest had a chapel built with an adjoining house near the convent of St. Mary of the Roses. 
There rose in a company, a small company of young women could follow a life of the religious. But the company of nuns received an order from the Holy See to close down the convent as it was too close to the other convent. At that time, cloistered nuns subsisted solely on begging and the generosity of the villages. To have two convents close by in the same village could be burdensome to the townspeople, or worse, could cause both convents to suffer. Rose returned to her parents' home. There she died on March the 6th, 1252. She was 17 years old. They buried her in the church of Santa Maria in Podio. But six years later, her body was transferred to the church of the convent of St. Mary of the Roses, just as she had prophesied. Now, although this church was burned down in 1357, her body remained intact and is preserved miraculously till this day incorrupt. Now each year her body is carried in solemn procession through the streets of Viterbo. Upon her death, Pope Innocent IV, the same Pope who had refused to allow her to have a convent near the other convent in Viterbo, ordered an investigation to commence into the virtues and sanctity of Rose of Viterbo. However, it was not to happen in his pontificate, but her canonization took place 100 years later in 1457. As with many saints of the past, the faithful proclaimed Rose saint before the official canonization took place. And it was not because of the great phenomena, the great miracles that had occurred during her life. She was not proclaimed saint because her body never corrupted and is corrupt, incorrupt till today. That even the veins, sister was telling me at the uh, convent, that the veins in her hands and the veins were found to go throughout her body. Even the veins had not uh, uh, collapsed. Uh, she is completely supple. But it was not even because of that that she was proclaimed a saint. The Lord proclaimed her a saint through his vicar, the Pope, because of the virtuous life that she led. You know, a thought that I, just came to me is that a, um, a, an urn, a, a vase, fell to the ground in, in a home. You know, Rose was always going to the people and trying to help them in every way. And it broke into many pieces. And oh, the woman, the, the mother of the household was just devastated because she knew she was too poor to, to be able to replace it. And Rose took the pieces and just put them together. That's who Rose of the Terrible was. She was someone who took the pieces and put them together whole so that that vase looked brand new. Rose and the roses that the Lord is calling today, you and us, will take the broken pieces of this world and put them together and make that perfect vase that Jesus wants us to be. Perfect vessels. Rose Viterbo lived and died for the church. Can we do any less? Frederick II went about, first of all, he betrayed the people. Does it sound familiar? He betrayed them. They trusted him. He didn't have to raise a, an arm against the people. They just let him walk in because they trusted him, and he betrayed them. The Pope trusted him. The Pope. Uh, crowned him and he betrayed the Pope. Now, do you ever feel helpless or hopeless and, and feel, well, what's happened? Or this couldn't be happening, uh, uh, he wouldn't do that, they wouldn't do that. 
Well, here is the story of Rosa Viterbo. Have the courage to be Catholic. Have the courage to take back your church, to take back your country, this country that was founded under God. What is the Pope asking of you today? Isn't he asking you to evangelize? That's what St. Rose did. She evangelized. And so I think we're going to name her the saint of the evangelistic young. You'll be another St. Rose of Viterbo. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of Rose of Viterbo. We ask you young people out there, this is a perfect role model for you. This is somebody you should study about, somebody you can get on fire about. It's a proud symbol of our people, a proud symbol of our church, loyalty to her pope. Today we need such loyalty to our pope. We want you to look at Rosa Viterbo, and then we want you to compare her with the false role models that are being held up to you today. I want you to look at this young girl and say, and look at her beauty. And then look at, at the mirror that the world holds up to you and tells you is the way to look. Make a choice. Make a stand. Others need to see your, you as a role model. They need to see that there is someone out there that believes in chastity, believes in their virginity, believes in their Lord. You start this. Be part of the gentle revolution. Pray for the intercession of this little holy innocent Saint Rosa Viterbo. We love you. God bless you.